And welcome to ETF Edge, your go-to place for everything exchange-traded funds. I'm your host, Bob Pisani, and we've had that space is the place. You've heard that? We believe it here. I'm a big space enthusiast. That NASA Mars landing, it was hugely successful. Got a lot of people excited. And while we are waiting for Kathy Wood's space ETF to actually appear, there are two existing space ETFs that are already out there that are raking in a lot of money, and we've got both of them here. So let's talk with Andrew Channon, who runs the Procure AM space ETF, the symbol UFO. Matt Bartolini from State Street runs the Spider Kencho Final Frontiers ETF, the symbol is ROKT. And my old friend Tom Lydon from ETF Trends joins us as well. You know, guys, I, I, I want to start by just referencing that amazing Mars landing because they did it with a video, <laughs> for crying out loud. Uh, they put out uh, a couple days later, beautiful uh, little piece of uh, tape here. Uh, they've provided just tremendous footage of the landing. Look at that, uh, including the parachute opening, which is, you know, my favorite part of the whole thing. You can see also the dust being blown around uh, as Perseverance uh, was landing. And when you consider how much could have gone wrong with this whole thing, it's really quite amazing. It's truly one of the great technological feats of all time. I mean, uh, just uh, look at the simulation that they're doing. It's quite amazing. Matt, the Mars Perseverance landing uh, itself, uh, it's gotten everybody excited uh, at this point. I wonder what you could weigh in here. There's a lot of publicly traded companies that help build that particular lander. And it's rare we get to say, hey, that company built that. But maybe you could help, you know, point it out to us. And your Final Frontier ETF has got a lot of those companies that built some of this. That's right, Bob. Uh, you know, the, the space exploration industry stretches beyond just sort of rocket manufacturers. You know, obviously, reusable rockets have you know, generated a lot of interest into the, into the marketplace and have created a lot of efficiencies. But there's also the you know, components and suppliers of you know, different parts of space exploration that extends to something that is in the public space. So a company like Maxar Technologies, it's part of our ETF. They are a builder of robotic arms for NASA since the, essentially the Apollo era. And NASA's Perseverance rover brings the sixth Maxar robotic arm to Mars. There's also other firms like Teledyne Technology. They are a company in providing aerospace and defense electronics. And, you know, you're talking about the video. You know, like some of their electronics help with the image sensories on, on the Mars rover Perseverance. There's other companies like Heiko Corp and Mercury Systems. You know, these sort of traditional people view them as traditional aerospace and defense companies, but they have a large impact on the space business. And part of our approach is to not capture just pure play, but also the ecosystem supplying this because there's so much left out there in terms of the space exploration business to uncover. Yeah. And, and, and Matt, the, the uh, Maxar tech, they actually built the robotic arms that are being used for this, for this, uh, for the Perseverance. Is that right? Or do I understand that that's right? Cr that's correct. I mean, you, you know, much like how uh, you have you know, firms that make the engine and part of the car, as well as the brakes, you know, Maxar Technologies is crucial to the, the ability for what we're seeing here on NASA do in terms of, you know, identifying, you know, potential life forms on the surface of Mars. I think mean, that's just a great innovation. Yeah. It's, it's something that we seek to capture with our, our suite of Kensho ETFs and obviously with Rocket with Space. Yeah, it's very exciting. Uh, Andrew, it, 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 as exciting as it is, I, I can't help but think watching this for so many years, it's really tough to, uh, to invest in space. There's not a lot of things that are out there. I remember 1970, I was very invested emotionally in the space program. I was 14 years old. I wanted to be a physicist. And for Christmas, I got my first share of stock. I got one share in a company called Kawiki Broco. They made beryllium, which is useful in, in the, the satellites, but it's used also as a space shield uh, to protect against heat. And my father gave me one share in a company called Kawiki Broco, and they made the beryllium, the space shields. And uh, the company got bought out the next year, but it was the first time I ever had a, a stock certificate, one share of Kawiki Broco. Uh, and I was so excited about it. That was 52 years ago, or 51 years ago, but it's still tough to invest you know, in, in space. Can you break down the various subsectors for us? Uh, what's out there? I mean, obviously, there's satellites that you're involved in, but there's rocketry companies and robotics companies that Andrew was talking about as well. 
Yeah, you know, UFO is you know, created to essentially make it easier to invest in space by having companies from around the world that are specializing in all different areas of the space ecosystem. So what is space? Space um, you know, is comprised of companies that are satellite manufacturers and operators, launch equipment companies, uh, companies creating hardware and software for space. Uh, a huge part of it, though, is communications. And when you actually look at the numbers for how big the space industry is, roughly one third of that is coming from broadband internet communications, typically using satellites. So that's a major, major part of the space economy. So you can't leave out satellites, in our opinion, if you're trying to invest in the space industry. But really, you know, you've got companies that are maybe doing a little bit in space and, you know, they're not really a space company, but then you have companies that are doing, you know, uh, you know, majority of their revenues from space. And because UFO has a global focus, it allows for the opportunity to include many different companies from around the world. And many of them are you know, pure play companies um, that you'll find in UFO. Yeah. Uh, Tom, way in here. I know you you watch this space uh, as well. The the I, I obviously if you look at Andrew's largest holdings, there are a lot of them are satellites. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, they're in terms of pure plays, they're the, the best ones that are out there. Do you anticipate, though, given the enthusiasm, the excitement generated by the Mars landing, uh, the fact that we've got private uh, companies involved as well, three big billionaires involved, uh, as well as Kathy Woods getting involved, do you think there's going to be a lot more out there to invest in the next couple of years? We're not going to be trolling around looking for just satellite companies, are we? No, well, you're right, Bob, and a lot of people are sharing your enthusiasm. Um, however, I think what Andrew and Matt are pointing out is the ETFs that are touching on this area um, aren't always the same. Their construction isn't the same. Their strategies aren't the same. And this is one thing we want to make sure we highlight. When you look at UFO, it's really earnings focused. Uh, and that's the premise for the components of that ETF. 44% is in the communication services sector. And then you go over to Rocket, uh, ROKT. It's more of an uh, index utilizing artificial intelligence, maybe more growth-oriented than earnings-oriented, not saying one's right or one's wrong, but we're going to see expanded areas, um, obviously, in the ETF space with Kathy coming on, too. But it's going to be important to lift up the hood because this area <laughs> is not going away. It's going to be with us for not years but decades. But there are going to be a lot of different ways to play it. Yeah, uh, I guess w what I'm excited about is we've already got some. So obviously we have the aerospace companies. Uh, then we have uh, manufacturing types, uh, which we discussed earlier, like Maxar Tech. Uh, we have uh, Virgin Galactic. Um, hopefully we're going to get SpaceX soon. A any thoughts uh, on, on that one, uh, Andrew or Matt? Um, SpaceX? Yeah, I mean, Tom, so we're just still, when are we going to see it? I mean, still unknown, right? I mean, it's a, been a private company, continuing to get series funding in the private markets. You know, obviously, it was a very similar run to Tesla, and you know, that eventually went public as well. Um, I, I think when we talk to investors about focusing on sort of space exploration is, is to, to not just look at, you know, the high-flying names of SpaceX or Blue Origin there in the private markets, but showcase what companies in the public markets are helped supplying them. So Aerojet, Rocketdyne, you know, their products and services are going to be part of the Blue Origin New Shepard, uh, one of the, the rockets that are going to be coming online in the near term. I think that helps underscore the sort of opportunity that you're seeing in space because there's sort of three catalysts that are sort of mutually reinforcing the opportunity right now. More efficiency. You have more government support. The Department of Defense has increased the budget related to space investments over the past three years. And then on the, on the last one, you, you basically have more commercial use cases, you know, more applications actually here down on Earth in terms of satellite technology. So, you know, while there's a lot of attention paid to SpaceX and Blue Origin, there are real components in the public markets. And that's what we're really trying to seek out with Rocket that people should be aware of. And I wouldn't yeah. leave it just And there. Andrew, I there's wonder also... if you could talk... Go ahead. Go ahead. There's also companies that are benefiting from successes by companies like SpaceX. So they're able to get the cost of launch down, and that's going to allow more companies to send things into outer space cheaper. So they're really opening up the entire environment for space companies and future would-be space companies to, to lower those barriers of entry. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and Andrew or anybody, just weigh in on that relationship, that public-private 
partner relationship. Uh, so we've got, you know, Elon Musk. We've got Virgin Galactic and Richard Branson. Uh, we've got Jeff Bezos. We've got three billionaires that are involved here. Can you characterize how they are interacting with, with NASA? I mean, Musk is at one time a collaborator and also a competitor of NASA. I'm wondering if somebody can comment on how that is playing out. Is, are, are we the investing public? Are we space buffs that we are benefiting from that um, collaboration slash rivalry? Somebody want to tackle that? I like to think well, so, because what you see is these companies are actually competing with each other on these NASA contracts. So to the extent that they're actually lowering the cost for NASA to embark on these various missions and goals that they have, they're actually freeing up more of NASA's budget to be able to invest in other areas of space. So this competition, I think, is very healthy. Not necessarily every company is going to be a winner, but hopefully this competition could drive down prices and also let the best technologies win. So I think it's a really exciting environment that NASA is actually going out and not just contracting these private companies, but public companies as well. I mean, if you look at the, the database of contracts that NASA has and other similar bodies, there's over 300 publicly traded U.S. companies that actually have these various contracts. So it's not just necessarily a pure play space company that might get a yeah. contract. But it's, it's really opening up opportunities for everyone. And I, I would sort of and add to that, that, too. I brought with, you know, I would just sort of add to that, the United Launch Alliance. That's, you know, basically uh, Lockheed Martin is part of that. And their their purchase or pending purchase of Aerojet Rocketdyne uh, is one of the reasons, uh, or one of the reasons is a result of SpaceX. So trying to compete uh, with SpaceX by acquiring Aerojet Rocketdyne, which helps reduce the cost of, of missile launch due to reusable rockets. So I think you can see the, the sort of derivative effects of a private company impacting the public markets just from that one example of Lockheed and Aerojet. Yeah. And, That's and a very just to good add, point. Guys, because you know, I was... just, just, to, just to add, Bob, a little bit, you know, it, it's, it's important to talk about what's going on outside of the atmosphere here, but also uh, when you look within our atmosphere, uh, you know, areas like in rocket actually have deep sea applications. Uh, there's a lot of companies involved in drones, uh, air taxis, electronic uh, or, or electric aviation vehicles. All that stuff's coming, and not all that's going to be a part of this as well. So when you when you think yeah. about uh, the space sector, there's a lot to cover for sure. Yeah, I think you brought up a very good point there, Matt, about Aerojet, Aerojet Rocketdyne uh, being bought by Lockheed. Because remember something, uh, NASA has been building big rockets for a long time. Elon Musk is now building a big rocket that is directly competing. There, are, there, there must be hundreds of NASA engineers there who've been working on a big rocket for decades who are looking at this saying, huh, are they going to replace me, essentially? So... Um, that's why I bring this up. I, I'm delighted that Elon Musk is bringing enthusiasm and efficiencies and, and real technological advances to the space race. I think it needs it. But at the same time, there is a certain competition, uh, as uh, exemplified in uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne uh, being bought by Lockheed there. <laughs>